Welcome to the third in a series we're calling L&D's Pivot to Performance, in which Guy Wallace and myself, David James, speak with esteemed guests about their own pivot from learning focus practice towards a performance orientation that more predictably and reliably, let alone efficiently and successfully, achieves demonstrable results for both employees and organizations. Over a total of seven sessions, each two weeks apart, we've invited guests that we know have made the pivot and have achieved real results from doing so. We'll invite our guests to share their stories, we'll question them so uh, on their approaches, and encourage them to share rely, um, uh, relatable experiences to inspire you to either initiate or enhance your own pivot. We'll also seek opportunities for you to get involved too. Now, at this stage, we'd like to get uh, add anything, Guy? Uh, no, thank you, David. That's uh, we're we're hoping to help everyone make this pivot to a performance orientation in learning and development, and to skip learning and development if it's not going to have the impact of performance that your customers, your clients need. Great. Thanks, Guy. Uh, well, perhaps, Guy, we should start with uh, with our own introductions, including our own pivot from learning focus to performance focus. Would you like to kick us off, Guy? Sure. Thanks. I, uh, I was lucky in that I was initially oriented to performance my first day out of college. I was This was way back in 1979, and the people that I went to work with had uh, been working with uh, a brother of Gary Rumler, who became my uh, guru, my mentor. And I had a chance to work with him in my second job out of college at Motorola. And Gary Rumler brought a performance, a process orientation to performance-based training or instruction or learning or learning experiences. So that was my orientation to always look at what is the job that people have to do? What are the outputs that they have to produce? How are they measured? What are the tasks that are performed? And to use that data to inform design and development of instruction. Um, so I feel like I was one of the lucky ones. And throughout my career, I've witnessed the fact that most people in the business weren't given that kind of a performance orientation. So David and I are hoping that through this series, we can help others make that pivot or continue their pivot to a performance orientation. Wonderful guy. Well, I'd say that I was in the other camp there. I spent at least a decade being learning focused and uh, I'm really polishing my toolkit to be to deliver the best learning I possibly can, uh, both in person and uh, and online. And it wasn't until uh, it, I really was held accountable to actual change that I realized that, that perhaps what I was doing wasn't truly affecting performance in a, in a predictable and reliable way when I was expected at Disney uh, to make a, a significant difference to, um, to the organization when it was making its own pivot, <laughs> both to digital in one respect uh, and then uh, with the merging of different um, parts of the business. And so we, were, we lent heavily on mini accelerated apprenticeship with absolutely no training element uh, as a part of it uh, because we knew that we had to make a difference. And I suppose that's where my pivot actually started. So I saw where do we find the tools where we can actually help to scale this rather than just provide learning. Uh, and that's where, you know, this, is, this has led me down this path here. And of course, to, to meet you, Guy, and, uh, and to meet you too, Anne-Marie. Thank you very much for being a guest today. Uh, Anne-Marie Burbage, who is uh, head of L&D at Utility Warehouse. Welcome, very much, uh, welcome to the conversation, Anne-Marie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, perhaps um, we can continue with some uh, introductions, Anne-Marie. And would you mind giving us a short introduction to you and your background in L&D, please? Yeah, sure. Um, it's interesting when you, Guy, when you were just saying um, kind of L&D on the route to performance and don't stop there. It's one of the conversations that we have quite a bit actually on that shift from training to performance. l and is a stop on the way, but that's just, it's, um, it's a point on the journey. It's not the end destination. So it kind of resonated. And I'm learning so much from these sessions as much as I am, because I consider myself to be in the midst of the pivot as opposed to having nailed the pivot. Um, but yeah, so my back, my um, background, I started out more generalist HR. So I studied business, studied with HR, went into a generalist HR role, did a bit of payroll, bit of recruitment, um, all great experience, you know, in that spirit of nothing wasted. Um, but they weren't for me, um, went into this generalist role. And then I think like a lot of people went into HR thinking I really love working with people, but I found that I wasn't working with people in the way that I would have hoped. So then started exploring, went and did some work with a, a learning and development team that within the business that I was in at the time. 
and it started there and that was 15 years ago which is frightening really but you know we talk about well, to, well obviously we'll talk about this a lot more but that's where I really started to kind of think well what what is this what, what's training what's it there for what's what's its role because I still think there is a role for training mm. um but it's just not not everything so that's when I thought we'll come into that and that's when I first started to kind of learn a bit more about uh, a performance approach and uh, and to to linger on that just a, a little longer, uh, Amory, uh, was there an aha moment for you? And um, from what was what was normal like before, and uh, and what did um, your uh, your your own personal pivot lead you towards? Mm-hmm. So I I would describe my the, my journey here as less of a pivot and more of a creep. Mm-hmm. I've kind of edged along and learned a lot along the way, and and taken uh, kind of taken insight from an awful lot of different places and a lot of different schools of thought. Um, I, so I've i always, I did more like you, my background was more like yours in that I, I, I did deliver quite a lot of training, but I've, I've always taken much more of a facilitative kind of approach. I, I went in reflecting on this. I never really liked to stand at the front of a room of people mm. and present myself as the expert on an anything. You know, my, my expertise is around facilitation, building conversation, learning, you know, kind of creating that environment and that space where people can kind of exchange thoughts, uh, explore ideas, present challenges, come up with solutions. And that the value for me was always in the conversation. Mm. Of course, I did have to do some kind of the more teaching end of the spectrum, but I always when I think back on it kind of always avoided being perceived as that person that was the expert on a subject and I was there to teach you about it Mm. um but I think from a pivot when I you know I think back there's one thing really does stand out to me one conversation really does stand out to me where someone came to me and said um we need training we're not I was working at the time on a a consultancy piece of work and I was working with a call center and they came to me and said um we're not keeping our, pro- our our advisors are not keeping their promises. They're saying they'll call customers back, and they're not doing. So they need some training. And I was like, "Wow, smell a bit of a rat here." Um, <laughs> or, or, or I'm sure there's not so much smell of rat. I'm sure there's more to this. Um, kind of looked into. It. I was like, "Well, you know, look, they they know physically how to make an outbound call, right? They know how to dial a customer." And then we're like, "Well, yeah, yeah, okay." So. So it's not that, it's not that they don't have the capability they need to do it, but then choosing not to, why not? Or something else is getting in the way. And I think, you know, at the heart of my approach here is when we go direct to training, we're assuming that the person is the problem. They're not Mm. skilled enough. They're not capable enough. They're not experienced enough. And actually, you know, my lived experience is that people can only perform to a level that the environment around them allows or the processes or the systems. So when we go straight to training, we're assuming that nothing else is the problem. The person hasn't got what they need. So we're going to train them up. I'm going to fix mm. it. Anyway, so um, after a bit of digging, you know, I was working with a colleague who was kind of helping me with this. And um, turns out things like um, people didn't have a way. So essentially what was happening is when uh, advisors were talking to a customer um, and something needed to happen before we could resolve their problem, we said, we will, we'll call you back at 4 p.m. on Wednesday. And then they didn't. So the customer would be sat there waiting for the call and this person hadn't rung them. And so the assumption was we need to train people on how to keep our promises and make these calls. Turns out they had no way of reminding themselves. So they had to remember on at four o'clock on Wednesday, I've got to make this call back. They, um, their bonus was based on inbound calls taken and outbound calls made were not counted. So people potentially were financially penalized for not doing not keeping the promise um the um what else they were they were saying things like i'll call you at 4 p.m on wednesday rather than i'll ring you on wednesday between four and six so of course if you're working in a call center it's not always that easy to ring at an exact time because you might still be on a previous call um so that took a little bit of convincing obviously the person who came to me asking for training had kind of outsourced the problem that they were experiencing to me um, and yeah. this is not my issue that I need to own. We need training and therefore now it's yours. You know, I went back and did some exploration around that. Anyway, it, obviously it took a bit longer. We could have just rolled out training to all of these people. 
and we didn't we explored all these other things and in fact I'd still say that piece of work in some respects is probably still going on because there's, there was a lot to unpack in there but it was just about shifting that conversation right mm. at the outset to you're assuming there's a training need here and I'm not I'm not sure that's quite right let's have a let's have a conversation tell me more I need to learn more about this. And the, probably that's the com- that's a scenario that sticks in my mind as a, we can't just keep assuming that training is the answer to all of our problems when we don't even know what the pro- real problem is. Yeah. And of course, that's that's the crux of it. And we've discussed that on the, uh, the previous episodes of this as well about uh, understanding what the real problem is leads you uh, a fair way towards the uh, the solution. Now, you used the words digging and exploring there, uh, mm-hmm. Amory, and I'm sure that, uh, uh, that you've refined your approach to analysis and discovery uh, since then. Uh, so to, to understand performance problems that you need to address, could you share with us uh, a high level of, uh, of, of what works for you? Uh, and then we'll dive into, uh, into that a little further in a moment. Yeah. And I think, you know, so I've listened to previous conversations and, um, and I've learned a lot from them. My approach, well, I'm absolutely aligned to the, um, the kind of what we're trying to do and why in terms of a shift of performance, I think my how is probably a little bit different. I, mm. my background is more kind of coaching facilitative so for me it always starts with a conversation Mm. and it's whatever people come with you know because the other thing I hear a lot is oh well someone comes to me asking for training therefore I'm kind of stuck and I have to deliver training Uh, I disagree I don't think you do I think that for me there's a reframe that we need to make in L&D that is um, when you hear when someone comes to you and says I need training don't hear training hear help yeah. Or support I need I need something else and I think that instantly opens your mind and kind of opens the conversation hmm. tell me more and in terms of what works for me I think really positioning yourself as a as a partner as an enabler as someone who understands what the uh, you know the customer so our customer is trying to do hmm. what good looks like to them if this has been success if this thing has been successful what does that look like what will you have that you don't have now what will hmm. you not have that you have got now and kind of really get them to think about about this and those are so the the coaching conversation I would say is something that I found really useful and really building trust and a relationship so that they know that when I'm challenging and saying I don't think training's the answer I'm not saying that because I'm trying to wriggle out of delivering training or I'm trying to back back or anything it's I'm I'm helping you get to the nub of the real issue so that we can Mm. actually solve it for you once and for all because if I deliver training, you're just going to probably come back to me in a few months time when it's not worked. And so can you deliver some more training? Yeah. Um, so those, so that's for me, the, the key bits of kind of what works. And then of course the work that I've then subsequently gone on to do with the team around, um, I have a couple of uh, fab learning business partners whose role it is to scale that up. Cause I can't, obviously I can't have all those conversations on my yeah. own. So really, you know, they partner with areas of the business to really get to know, you know what success looks like what are the challenges what's happening in those areas from everybody so mm. that's the other thing it's not just about a kind of a top down what i'm being told from leadership or management we'll come on to this but really talking to users mm. talking to all our customers at all levels in all departments really understanding what's going on for people um so yeah the that's you know when we do mm. we do loads of forums listening groups uh, research, user research, um, get loads of feedback and, and that real iterative approach using all of that. So if we, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, it really helps uh, at that high level to, uh, to, to, to understand how, how you position this. And, uh, and, and as you said, the, with, uh, with you being way down on your journey as far as your pivot was concerned, and then with the skills that you've developed for your level, you're going to be able to have those coaching conversations. Of course, you're going to have the currency. You then said that uh, you've got the business partners that help you scale that because, of course, you can't do this uh, all yourself. I'd love to get down into brass tacks here. If you think about um, uh, a common way in which needs either surface or are brought to you with your, you know where, where perhaps the traditional way is to take the order or to to, to start uh, understanding um, what what said training might look like um, how uh, how do you take it from there or how do your business partners now could you talk talk us through in detail what that initial conversation with that stakeholder might might look like um, mm-hmm. how that then is explored to to a sufficient extent that you have explored it enough that you can begin design and then put in a solution into the hands of uh, of those who need it yeah 
And I'd say the first thing that comes to mind with that is that it needs to be much more proactive, not reactive. Mm. So, so we, so we spend a lot of time in kind of meetings and conversations and like operational or strategic, strategic, sorry, conversations where then we're not actually there talking about learning at mm. all. We're just talking about them doing, we're hearing what's going on. And um, I was listening to a podcast yesterday, actually with one of Brene Brown's and um a guest on there was talking about opportunity goggles and I love that phrase and approaching all of these conversations with opportunity goggles so we're we're kind of on the lookout for stuff all the time making links one of the other things you know I talked before I just mentioned that I pull thoughts from a lot of different places you know very much the spirit of find our flavor so we get inspiration from all over the show one of the things I really like some of the systems thinking pieces mm-hmm. seeing things as a holistic um you know not seeing things in silos so when people come with a specific problem and say, we need training for this, you lose so much of the context and yeah. so much of the richness and, you know, the story and what's really going on. So actually, I forget what was your, I forget what your actual kind of, your question was, but it was more for me around constantly understanding, constantly mm. looking for opportunities, not waiting to be asked for something, but but spotting an opportunity and yeah. making links um, and and so so you said that have you have you got have you worked to that stage or, or was there a point in which you'd said to your team right I need I need you in here because um, I, I know that the, a common um, objection to to a pivot or or any fundamental change in in learning and development is bringing stakeholders along because it is assumed that when training is asked for the vast majority of the time the stakeholder is going to put their foot down and say no. I want that training. And for, certainly from my experience, and the more we've done these, we've realized that, and to your point, they're not asking for training, they're asking for help. So so, um, so that tap doesn't automatically get turned off. But you know, what you're describing here isn't too dissimilar to what Sebastian was talking about when he's saying he has a very transparent backlog of, of the things that, that really need um, um, working on. And they are business critical rather than the could you deliver me some email training or or, or something daft like that uh, so so did you craft your way into the organization to be to 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 be there when the decisions are made or your people were there when decisions were being made uh, or was has that been an evolution over time an evolution over time we've mm. wiggled our way in to some yeah. of these kind of conversations and i think that's that come back to that building trust earning kind of credibility in that conversation adding value to those conversations being there for a reason with a purpose and so it might have started out where someone was invited to a conversation as a one-off and then added value and still there yeah (laughs) and so I think we've definitely worked to it we've definitely and as a skill it's a skill that we've scaled up within the team so perhaps talk about later but we've got the partnering side of the team we also have a product a learning product side to the team so that's mm-hmm. why we do have the the backlog and the learning partners of course inform the backlog as long as long as along with working with our colleagues in the people team and across the business mm. um, and understanding you know it's that t- understanding the business goal you know what mm. are we there to do what's what's the, the strategic objectives of the business and we absolutely align to that because if we're not supporting that then how, well, how can we be adding value yeah and, and just be clear they didn't wait for an invitation for this uh for a seat at the table did they Emory? no 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 <laughs> i mean like like a bit like because you don't you know it's not full-on muscling in but it's no you've, you've got you, you i just think if you wait for an invitation it's a bit like training you know, people say they come and ask for training you know look they're just using they don't necessarily mean training mm. they, that's the only vocabulary they've got it's they yeah. think i you know i come from a place of i think people mean well people are well intended mm. they do the thing they think they're supposed to do so they come to the what they perceive to be this team who does learning and say, oh, we need training. Like, cool. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's only when you get to know more about those areas of the business and those teams and how they work and those leaders and how, you know, what good looks like to them, what success looks like to them, that you're able to have better conversations, but no, you, it might start with a, with a one-to-one conversation. Um, or maybe it's kind of starts with, you know, you know that that meeting takes place, you have a conversation with one person, maybe another person, oh, it would be great if we if we come along and then someone invites you. And so it's out. what you're not going to see is overnight, all of a sudden, every relevant meeting that happens in any organisation, they suddenly start inviting the learning and development no. team. That epiphany is not going to happen to no. you. <laughs> so you've got to, you, you know, you've got to take your opportunities, take put your opportunity goggles on. 
and look mm. for the the way in. So, so in terms of so, so if you've got your business partners, you've got your ear to the ground, and you and you're recognising where you could add value. Um, could you talk us through your um, your analysis to determine um, what the actual problem is, so you can see where you can add value, and also your prioritisation? Again, Sebastian mm-hmm. last week talked about uh, they had a very transparent. Um, um, system of requesting help from learning and development, and then yeah. people could see um, just just where where their request fit into the overall um, uh, scheme of things. You talked there about a backlog, so you've got a prioritization uh, process. Yeah. yeah, we have, and I um, I was quite inspired by that part of Sebastian's conversation because that, that's something that we're still working on for mm. sure. The the rigor and the robustness. We've you know we've kicked around the concept of a the form and we can you know for I think you know it back to the spirit of finding your flavor I think for us in our business right now a form doesn't feel like quite the right thing mm. we use the, the questions in the form to shape the conversations that we have so we do it in a more probably more human conversational kind of way mm. um and I aspire to to kind of adopt some more of those bits that Sebastian brought really but um the so you said um what's our what's our process for yeah, yeah, that's analyzing it. the need that's it yeah for determining that it that it is a need to what extent it's a need who's involved and uh, and, um, and yeah take you right to the point where solution is the next step yeah so it starts with those partners mm-hmm. starts with the partners kind of really understanding asking the questions um kind of really le- you know what good looks like mm. if we if we're getting to good to performance and that, that you know what good looks like is the language we put around it um, if what what is high performance and um, where are we now you know kind of what's the gap between two how can we kind of start to make our way through that and then at that point you know so we have a, a weekly conversation with our learning product team and we all come together and go right so then that's when the, the people that work in product um would would ask more questions and then at that point there's kind of a handoff really mm. um so th- there's more than one kind of uh piece of work if you like that we can end up with in L&D so some of it's the, the business partners just take it the partners just kind of will have the conversations and and deal with it other bits they you know maybe we spot some links between something that's going on in a few different teams or a few different business areas so it becomes something a little bit bigger mm. um, and then you know the question is um, one of impact versus effort so mm. how much work needs to go into this how how big is it how much resource do we need is it just something that we can do or do we need to collaborate with other teams, other departments? Because of course you've then got to get time from them. You've got to get their buy-in. You've got to get their resource. Um, versus how you know how, how much of a difference is this going to make? How much value is this going to add? How how big a problem is it going to solve? How many problems is it going to solve? Um, so yeah, that's when we we start kind of getting into um, the prioritization of our work and mm. um, there's a lot to do. There's always a lot to do. I don't I don't think we'll ever not be in that situation really because the world's changing so fast that for you know the list we've got now might not be the list forevermore but also we know our backlog is a backlog it doesn't mean we're going to do all of those things yeah because there'll be some things on there that drop off before they ever get to the top of the list mm. and that's a constant re-evaluation like what are all the things so for us the backlog is somewhere to to put ideas to put thoughts to put um something that maybe is a you know a harder deadline like so there might be a piece of work that's coming up with a specific deadline we log it all in the backlog. So there's quite a mixture in there. And then we have a backlog refinement conversation where we say, well, these are all the things coming up, what we're going to pull through. Then mm. the product team work in sprints. Um, so pull work through. Um, and we're constantly reevaluating, reprioritizing what's what's coming up, what's next. And that's, you know, that though these are this isn't easy because the mm. reality is if you went out to the business, they'd tell you everything was important. Somebody would argue that everything on there should be at the top of the list for one reason or another. Yeah. So that, that, you know you, and and that's where the good relationships and the trust we come back to that where we're, you know we're able to have good quality conversations with people because they trust that um we understand their problems what they're trying to do and and that we'll be really honest and open with them mm. i've got a have got a, a follow-up question Emery, and uh, and mm-hmm. before i before i um give that i will um uh, throw out there if anybody else has got any questions this is the time if you wanted to uh, we're going to pause in a in a sector to, to invite your questions so so please share those 
um, if you have any. But uh, but you've you've used the word product a few times, which is going to be alien to 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 many in learning and development because uh, where you're using product, others might be thinking that the design team would be the uh, uh, the the logical um, extension of, uh, of of your team. Uh, why yeah. why product and how is it different from say a traditional design team? Uh, there's more to it. Design mm-hmm. is a part of the end-to-end product kind of cycle. And so if, um, if we just went with design, I'd be concerned that we were missing out on um, this, this, the principles that go along it around user centricity, user research, data, feedback, ev- being really evidence-based and mm-hmm. um, releasing value. You know, So this is where I kind of pick bits from the product world, but I'm not purist to that, um, and pick bits from the world of agile. Uh, you know, and they're, they're a little bit different, but... It, essentially what happened was you know we, we were going out and we were working with the business really close you know more closely and surfacing things and then we needed a way of scaling up and mm. we needed a way of kind of prioritizing and and working working through the the work that was coming our way and that's when kind of introduced and scaled up the product capability in the team so it starts with that really understanding we've done quite a lot of work around understanding our audience mm. so built personas and now we work more closely with our the wider people team on this but um really building out you know really knowing who our audience is and whether you call them learners or whatever you know what who are who are the different audiences and how do you slice this up of course now we've got a combination of kind of quite volume roles we've got quite niche specific roles we've got people who work at home permanently people who work in the office permanently people who work in a, a combination of those um so that you know we've adopted a hybrid way of working so it, it's really understanding what are the needs and the challenges from all of those um from all of those groups of people um i just noticed there's a question i don't know whether it's worth going there <laughs> but um yeah, so the so really understanding the the user and having a really user centric approach. So it's not about um, this person has requested this thing. Mm. We're kind of switching it then to what this person's trying, what the end user's trying to do, and how yeah. we support that with the performance support. Of course, we've built our digital capability with you know the digital platform, the learning platform that we now use enables us to do that, and all mm. the capability that brings. So the product team are very aware of the broad range of tools available to them. Mm. Um, having done rigorous research in conjunction with the partners and then at the back end getting the feedback and keep yeah. iterating. It's that iterative approach. I think, you know, design, when you work with just a design team, it's very much, here's a, here's a problem. Here's a design, the solution, roll it out. That's done. it. Mm. see them see much I draw a lot more links than that. There's a lot more. And, you know, when I've got this one problem here, where else is it? Where else might we find it? Mm. And, and whilst uh, whilst we'd, we'd never advocate um, silver bullets on uh, on on this show, uh, I, I, certainly I recognise that product management is is a useful step between the learning focus and the performance orientation for the reasons you've just described. Your, pro- your product team aren't going to accept your order; they yeah. need to. They need data. They need they need to understand, as you said. Uh, the um, not what it not just the uh, for the user perspective, but the organisational challenge that uh, that that they that they are facing to do their full research so that they can work with you to actually um, solve the problem, which is the pivot to performance as uh, as we've been discussing here. I think that product management is uh, is certainly uh, an edge term and uh, and discipline within learning and development, but one that's certainly growing. But you're right, Anne Marie, yeah. in that we do have questions. I think a couple of questions <laughs> have come through, Guy. If you wanted to uh, to share those. Yes. Um, so Richard, so a couple of questions here. I'll start with Richard's question. Interesting to hear that you describe yourself as mid pivot. In what sense do you think you've still got a way to go? So what, what, where are you going to go next with this pivot? Mm -hmm. So, um, we've definitely done this quite a bit, you know, we've kind of got a few examples. I think, you know, I, I never went out with the intention of, um, I'm going to tell everybody what I can do. And when they all agree with what it is I can do, then I'm going to start doing it. We kind of went out, went with much more of a, let's just, let's just have a go. Let's pick some, let's, let's take our chance, our moment, take our opportunities, do it where we can. So I think if you wait for all your stars to align and be able to do this consistently across everywhere, I don't know how long you're going to be waiting for, but I didn't want to wait that long. <laughs> so um, it's, there's some parts, uh, some occasions where 
we go straight in with this and it works really well and others it, it, it takes a little bit of warming up for people but I really wanted to build almost some case studies some scenarios some evidence other than because I say so you know and I have had a couple of conversations where I've gone just like trust me go with me stay with me for a minute let's let's explore something different here but knowing they know I'm doing that with positive intent I know what they're trying to do I'm in their corner I'm on their side it's not a it's how I can work with them and how the team partners and works with someone uh, or a, a team kind of to to help them achieve success or high performance or whatever that is so I have had to kind of I'd, I'd say mid pivot because I don't think we're smashing all of this consistently yet. The other thing I would love us to be able to do more is um, kind of more on proving the impact, pro- you know, being a bit more consistent with that because some we find that easier in some situations than others. So I think that's the other thing, you know, for me. And then that bit that is a little bit more rigor around what I liked about the, um, something that Sebastian said was being able to present the leadership with here's all of the challenges that are going on in the business right now. Let's, let's prioritize that together. I, I, I was quite um, intrigued by that. So yeah, that's, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. So uh, uh, some more questions. Are your, uh, L and D business partners, I guess the guys with the opportunity Googles on, uh, uh, got on. Are are they centralized? Are they working at cross function with the business? Uh, no, so are they, they, or, they have, are they distributed, or are they so do they specialize, or are they kind of generalists working anywhere across the business where the uh, requests come in? No, they have um, they have business areas each. So um, right. there's one part of the business that's really kind of operational, customer facing, customer focused, high volume, um, and they, you know, there's specific there's specific challenges and specific um, parameters in which we can operate with in that part of the business. It's different to um, the uh, somewhere where there's kind of uh, they're not volume roles. They're um, maybe individual contributors working in a slightly different way so that that for us is how we've divided it up for now because that's what makes sense to us and our business at the moment did they experience any walls uh silos and it was hard to break through and get into and so how did they you know uh, deal with any of that how did they get themselves get themselves into these parts of the business yeah yes yeah we we experience walls um Yes, we experience silos. I think, you know, it, it, this is this is a long journey. This mm-hmm. takes time. You know, I, I, I'm I still learning all the time. Um, you've got your early adopters, right? And I just think, like, don't try and boil the ocean. Pick a bit, pick an in, pick a one. Go to the people who are game, open, happy to um, explore and experiment with you. It might be that you've got a, a really good relationship Um somewhere already start there um and then start to kind of prove the concept and build it up and scale it up because i think um it it can be quite overwhelming actually to sort of we're going to do all of this everywhere all at the same time Mm. and you will have different levels of success in different 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 pockets um and yet you know that's one of the things that we do when we come when we come together so yeah there are of course differences but there are similarities you know things like your leadership population experiences um different but also similar challenges across any organization um there's some things consistent and some things that are unique um you know things like onboarding is something that um you know so some of them some of our projects if you like are consistent their whole business their whole thing and then where we need to we can bespoke but there are other things that are, are quite specific to a certain business area um and we, you know, I'm a massive fan of a, a kind of a pilot, a test and experiment and scale up. And certain ideas are more suited to certain areas. But I would just, my suggestion there would always be start with your, your there will be an early adopter. There'll be a, a keen bean somewhere. Find them, build the relationship with them and start there. And they become your champion. You know, they become an ally and they become a voice. Um, you know, my outlook on le- sort of learning and development is quite a decentralized model. I, I would not like, for L&D to be a gatekeeper of anything. We don't, you know, your learning and development team don't own the learning or the knowledge in a business. Um, so, you know, kind of, you, I think 
it's I think good L&D is quite stealth like in many respects, mm. but it's also you, you're well networked because you're kind of drawing links. So that's another goal, like build your internal network. Mm. So another question that we have here, uh, and it, it kind of segues into a question that I had, um, because my question would have been, what other interventions or solution types is your organization, are you dealing with, and are you doing this in partnership with, you know, IT or the sales organization or other, other functions within the company? Um, yeah, so we, um, right, so what's the, what are the intervention types? So everything, anything, totally open-minded. Um, I got asked the other day, um, what do I think about VR in, in L&D? So, well, I love it if it's the right solution to your problem, mm. like, like anything, I, like I don't, I'm um, what's the phrase? I'm solution agnostic. <laughs> I don't, I don't mind what the, the solution is, but as long as it works, so as long as it works, it's scalable to the point at which we need it to be. And we, the only way we're going to know that is if we've delved into the problem mm. and really kind of understood what the problem is. Um, and, you know, so our solutions are, I mean, it could be anything from, we do do, Work kind of workshops, facilitated conversations, community building, um, kind of opportunities, um, video. Uh, we've got podcasts. We we do have a, a tool where we build e learning, where that's the relevant thing. If it's quite instructional, we um, it could be a simple kind of bit of text, could be a written resource, screencasts are something that we've done um, a, quite a bit of recently, just to help bring video to life. Um, talking to people that kind of even pieces to smartphone camera got a bit more of that going on at the moment see that took a little while because people are like oh god I can't do that mm. I can't talk into a camera and then you're going to pop it on the system and everybody look at it um sure you can <laughs> because it's the whole it's like let's informalize this let's if you were in a, a meeting or in a conversation and someone asked you how to do it because you know I think when someone's struggling to do something, they'd love to just ask the person sat next to them. Like, can you just show me how to do this? Well, that's quite tricky at the moment. And also it's not scalable, but something you can do is record a really short one, two minute smartphone video that we can share with people. And it just makes it feel a bit more friendly mm. and just sharing, sharing a bit of knowledge um, or a bit of experience. So yeah, there's a quite a broad range of, so, and, and I would say, for me, the opportunities are endless. I mean, of course, there's always a cost implication. But if I, we, we're really in our kind of product conversations and the, wide, the wider conversations, when people have come up with ideas, like, yeah, let's give it a go. Let's have a look. Test it. What's the worst that can happen? Let's find a way of testing it that's not massively risky. Have a go and then see where, we, you know, see where that takes us. Hmm. And we have another question here. This is directed at all of us, the three panelists here. Mm -hmm. How do you measure performance and therefore your impact on that performance? What was that how? Yeah, how do you measure performance? Who's going first? <laughs> oh, you, you are our guest, so. Oh, am I? All right. Okay. <laughs> Unless you want I to haven't... defer it to one of us. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I wish, I wish there was one simple formula to this. I wish I could say, here's the answer, uh, the silver bullet, and this, but it's not. But I, um, I, again, what's the problem? And if we're able to shift the problem, so again, it's not necessarily if we can solve the whole problem. If we're nudging it in the right direction, what might, might we be seeing? Mm. You know, and I hear people say, well, we'll see something happen, whatever that is, or we might see nothing happen. And that's, that would be good because I want to see, I don't, you know, um, it, you know, I'm looking at, you know, for me, that data pool is everything from customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction. I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at analytics and, you know, what people access on our LXP. Um, I'm looking at things like speed to capability. Um, uh, what else have we, the other measures we use? Um Go on, chip in if you've got anything. Um, you know, it's what, however you define performance at the okay. outset of the conversation. Yeah, that's, that's it, the yeah. bit you're coming back to. And I think that's yeah. the other thing for me that I would just flag is that contracting bit up front. While we all agreed what success looks like here, if we've got this right, or at least if we've started to nudge things in the right direction, have what what will that look like? Mm. Because that's that can't happen at the end. That has to happen at the beginning. 
Yeah. And I say the key to that is uh, data and evidence based practice. It's to what extent you know that it's a problem at the outset. So um, so something that uh, is surfaced to you or a need that comes to you is purely an assumption. You need to figure out whether that is actually a problem. Um, so you can uh, so you can brainstorm. What would you as to your point, Anne-Marie, what would we see? Or what would we not see if this was actually a problem? So that's your that's your data. So you go and find that out. And that's your ground zero. If you figure that that is a problem, then your ev- evidence-based element to that is go and, f- go and speak with the people who are responsible for doing the work and getting the results to figure out what it, what it is that they don't have or they need in order to solve this problem. So you're already contracting with the people who are responsible for the actual work. And then anything that you do should be getting you, moving you in a positive direction uh, from your ground zero. And that is your performance element. I'd say that if you don't know that it's a real problem, then it's just in the wind and you're leaving it to pure chance and hope. And then it comes down to uh, to um, the, uh, the, the old uh, L&D tried and trusted measure of success unintended consequences because it's just nice to do things and it's you know we didn't have something before so what harm could it have done it's all it's all about the unintended consequences when you don't actually know the problem that you're solving i am gonna so i am gonna encourage a bit of a a mindset challenge though around this that is i think when you when you roll out training and you um and maybe there's a test in there and someone passes the test or you do a feedback form at the end and someone says, yeah, I had a nice time. Yeah, the trainer was good. Yes, I'm going to do something differently as a result of this. You feel like you've measured something. Mm. And so, you know, the natural question is, well, if I'm going to do something different and it's not training, how will I measure that instead? I would just question whether there was any value in the, the measurement we were getting from the previous version, whether it was actually doing anything. Um, yeah, that would be. So I would just encourage a, a kind of think. You know, why why are we asking that question? What are we trying to get at? I know. Yeah. Is it about trying to prove value? Is it about trying to prove impact? Is it about trying to achieve performance? You know, why why are we why are we trying to get at that measurement? Hmm. And of course, Guy, you have more experience than uh, Anne Marie yeah. and myself. Would you? What would you add? Well, I, I guess I was influenced by Gary Rumler, who I talked about a little bit earlier, and uh, but also the total quality management movement that really aligned with my process orientation. So my definition of performance competence, which is what I would try to be measuring, is people's ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. And that means you need to understand the workflow and what is produced by the workflow and output, which becomes an input downstream someplace else, and then the various stakeholders. So who are the stakeholders for that output? Is it regulatory bodies? Is it managements? Of course, it's the downstream customer, but then there's the tasks that are performed, the behavioral and cognitive tasks that have to be performed to produce an output. Um, and, and so you need to be able to look at what, what are, who are the stakeholders for that and what are their requirements? And I think, so I learned to really kind of take a look at, you know, whatever request comes in is to try to figure out, you know, if it's a topic I'm given, I need to turn that into how does that topic apply to tasks and what are those tasks and behaviors aiming to produce? Because people aren't on the payroll just to perform tasks or employ behaviors. They're there producing things of value that are then an input elsewhere to the final customer or to internal, the next step in the processes, et cetera. So my measurement is always of what's being produced and that's the first thing I would measure. And what's, you know, what are the, you know, how can you tell good from bad? What are, what are the earmarks of good? Is it quality, quantity, cost, time, an aspect of time, uh, schedule, et cetera. Um, but, but anyway, so that kind of answers uh, Laura's question. Thank you, Laura, for that question. David, back to you. Wonderful. Um, Amory, if we again uh, take this, uh, this practical, so practical. Um, um, could you give us a real life example of how um, a problem was presented or you, you, uh, you recognize the need, uh, the analysis, the discovery you, uh, you undertook uh, to understand and diagnose and then what you actually did to address it? Yeah, so I've got quite a recent one. Um, implemented a new system um, and, uh, you know, I was approached and, and by one of the project team, we need to roll out some training 
mm-hmm. this new system. Um, can we talk? Sure, we can. And I think that's like, for me, yeah, come back to it. I, I heard, of course, can we have training? But I didn't think to myself, the answer's obviously then got to be training. Otherwise, I've got to tap out of this conversation now. Mm-hmm. It's like, right, sure, talk to me. I went in and we've got all these users and this is what they have to do. And I think, you know, particularly when it comes to system stuff, most systems now, if you've made a decent choice in the one that you're using, it's quite intuitive. Mm. So I think gone are the days of needing to sit there with hundreds of people in a room teaching them how to click a button. Um, and if you think, you know, we don't do that, do, you know, like any other system, any app you get on your phone, no one teaches you how to do it. There's no training that comes with Facebook when you sign up to that app. You, you know, you poke about and you find your way. Mm. Um, but, of course, there was, there was definitely a actually the bigger piece around this was change changing in the process changing and understanding what's expected of people um so so that opened up the conversation had the conversation with the product team the the project team that were implementing this new system you know what if this is successful what will you have in three months six months 12 months if you're it's not about the the input that is any training like tell me what success looks like to you in your terms what are you what are you trying to achieve what are you trying to do and kind of loads of conversations around that and um you know what's your expectation of people Mm. um so kind of lots of conversation on that capturing all of that and then um essentially the decision what or my recommendation and then this was one where i kind of had to say look i hear you i hear you that you're looking for training but here's my worry about training um because it's a system thing what are people going to refer back to So if you're in that room and you're learning how to do something in a really controlled environment, that's great. But then when you go back and do it in real life and and the thing you're trying to do doesn't look quite like it did on the screen in the training, or where do you go? Who does that person then go to? You're Mm. probably still going to generate questions and thoughts. What about if new people start? Like how, how will you catch them? going forward um you know what about if there's changes in the system are you gonna you essentially when you start with training potentially you're committing yourself to retraining constantly and there's a cost associated with that because of course there's a you know on this occasion it was a a consultant but it need not be but there's still a cost so um what we've what we did was we kind of we took apart the, the process and said, what are the, what are the, the parts of the process? What are the actions that people need to do? What do people need to be able to do? And we've built available kind of 24 seven in the flow of work, what I'd call performance support. Mm-hmm. They are screencasts with a how to, but there's a little scene set before. So there's, there's a, a bit at the beginning of the story that says, this is, this is why we've done this. This is what we're looking to do. This is the process that, and this is your role within it. Here's the individual actions with then kind of top tips because the actual action in the system is one thing, but the how to get it right, what the watch outs are, that's mm. something else. So that's in there. Um, so that just sits there now. It's available in our LXP. But what we're also doing is we're, we're just kind of doing a little bit more with this is looking at how we can push that to people at the point of need. Yeah. So, for example, when you when you go into the, this system and you're trying to do, you know, there's an approval process that goes alongside the system. When someone gets that, you need to approve something email. Here's also a link to the resource to help you do that well. Mm. Um, and yes, yeah, so the in terms of analytics so far, there's been quite a bit of take up for that. It, and most people, most users have just kind of got on in and, and, and it's worked. We have had more questions. So we are now kind of iterating all of that. Um, so we are kind of developing a couple of those screencasts, adding bits to the resources. We've built an FAQ document that as we're learning, this is, you know, other stuff that so that we're just sharing the, the same people or well, different people are asking the same question over and over again. They've got a, a somewhere to go. Um, we, we, we're making some tweaks. We're also then, there were a couple more complex scenarios that have surfaced. So we've put on some uh, like drop-ins where you can still come along and ask, but bring a specific scenario. So rather than going and sitting in training and either touching a little bit that doesn't really capture everything or going exhaustive list and training on absolutely everything that most people will never actually need, here's the basic, get out get out the traps, do what you need to do. If you've got any questions, here's the other support that's in place with the drop-ins and the, the, it's a Slack channel you mm. know, for asking questions on there. And that's that's where we've got to. So now... We're just kind of measuring the impact of that. And it's, again, you know, there's no, there is no um, 
101 out of 102 people have completed this resource and therefore it's been a success mm -hmm. done it's it doesn't stop you know we've people have accessed it most people have then been able to do what they want to do but then there's more advanced users that we've then needed to put something a little bit more but if we'd have just gone straight in with those clinics or the drop-in sessions everyone probably would have just gone to those and expected the training yeah so that's um that's something that we've we've done quite recently that's worked well and actually it's interesting that the one of the project teams you know we're so grateful that you encouraged us to do it this way because we've learned so much from the process of our users using these that we've then gone on and we've been able to iterate so we're you know we're, we're not very far into it but we've already got something out there and it was very quick we didn't have we you know we were able to turn around this around really really quickly we didn't have to design a, a huge training program got it out really quickly um most people have got on okay some haven't We've then iterated and added to it and keep going. And yeah. we're just we're learning as we go. And you've saved um, uh, everybody in the future from having to uh, attend dreadful refresher training, uh, which I think I'm not sure yeah. <laughs> anybody ever thanks LD for putting on refresher training. No, no, sadly. <laughs> um, but, yeah, and, but the team, you know, we've all learned. We've all learned. Like, so, we, you know, there's a retro, a retro around that. So, right, so what worked, what didn't work? Because yeah. the, whilst it's a learning, it's learning in the business, it's learning for the team as well. Yeah. What did we do? What, uh, what else could we have done? Now, what do we know now that we didn't know then that we, and, uh, that we might have done? Because that then informs our investigative problem digging conversation next time because mm. we've learned from, you know, things that we've bumped into this time. Well, in the essence of, uh, of learning, Anne-Marie, um, a final question uh, from me. Um, what suggestions would you give to others uh, who are listening who want to adopt or have their own pivot to performance? Mm -hmm. Start small would be my um, – start somewhere. Someone's got to go first. So mm. it's, it's unlikely that someone's going to come to you and, and either, say, pull up, pull up a chair at my table or um, can, can you – build me some performance support. Here's my performance problem and here, that I've got. That, that's not likely to happen. So mm. find find your in somewhere, a person, a process, um, an opportunity that you spot, um, something that you hear. You know, it might be that there's something that comes up time and time and time again and you kind of go, oh my God, I keep getting asked about this. Or it might be a piece of training or something delivery that you've, you're you on a bit of a, a kind of a, I don't know what, like, You've done it before and yeah. again and again, and we're still refreshing people. Or mm. it's something that you you know in your heart of heart that training hasn't solved the first time, so don't go back and do it again. Mm. Look for the opportunity to to kind of just kind of lean into that and you know, stick your opportunity goggles on it. And <laughs> you know what what one thing can I try? What one place? It might be a particular bit of training that you've got now, or or something that you've got now. Just try doing one thing different and and see how that goes and and kind of iterate and learn from that um you won't be able to do everything all at once mm. so you know just give yourself a break yeah brilliant uh, and guy any uh, any quick questions that uh, that we can uh, that we can share before we uh, wrap up yeah i so are there any references or uh resources people podcasts books articles that have had a meaningful impact in your approach to all of this that you might share with other folks oh loads um so uh, the agile hr uh movement take a lot of inspiration from there kind of product and technology and how people how you know how things happen that software product of course is quite different but it's about taking inspiration as opposed to carbon copying and doing it um marketing ways of working so mm. the mass marketing stuff i find really interesting but also you know tapping into our internal marketing team and and using them that's something really useful of course you know all of all of the learning and development podcast stuff i find that really insightful inspirational so um yeah that i think those are probably I thought if I think of anything else, I'll pass it to you so you can pop it in the notes, but I'm constantly looking at this sort of stuff and I love the, I'm a big fan of the, I take my personal inspiration, I think, from a lot of the Brene Brown, Dare to Lead podcast, I, you know, around just it's okay to be a bit vulnerable, curious learning mindset, go in, have a go, 
be human with people and I think people buy into that and they, they you know it, it's they, they trust you uh, mm. because they, they, they know that you're you, you know positive intent brilliant that's wonderful thank you so much uh Anne-Marie this has been uh, hugely insightful and uh I'm sure that it's been uh, it's been very useful for for those who have been able to join us today uh, but also for those who will be able to watch the uh, the recordings and listen to it when it is on the uh, uh on the podcast so so thank you very much again for uh, uh for taking the time and thank you uh everybody for uh, attending uh, here if I could just uh, have just a a, a a small moment of your time to let you know uh, of what we have coming up so um, as you are aware uh, we have these sessions uh, every two weeks uh, and so two weeks today we are joined uh, by Dawn Snyder uh, on November the 3rd uh, for our very next installment and you can see the others from there and you'll also receive a, uh, a link to sign up to that too so please uh, put that in your diary uh, we'll follow up in the next day or so um but all left to say is uh, is thank you very much uh, again um uh, and we hope that we'll see you again very soon thank you <laughs>